This oh, episode's no. off the rails. Goodness gracious, that way. I I would argue this one started off not on the rails and just continued to proceed even more. Yeah, this is all off the rails. Gracious. This yeah, is that good. So, oh my god. Okay. This all is right. good. This um, is gonna be a great episode. No edits. Okay. Just put it up raw. Just I was gonna say, just raw. release it. <laughs> just record right. an intro at the beginning and be like, "Hey, a little peek behind the curtain. We had to Dice record this one uncut." After all of our respective bedtimes, so Honestly, I, I might consider that. That's not that's not terrible. Dice Pirates uncut. Let's do it. Greetings and salutations, board game fans. The Dice Pirates are back with episode 26, our spooky games episode. Mm. Halloween's coming up. It's always fun to go ahead and take some time with the family, play some games that have a spookier feel to them. I'm your Captain Ian, as always, joined by Matt and Aaron. How you guys doing? I'm great. I'm ready to talk about some boo ord games. Boo boo ord games. Boo ord games. You get it? I'm just going to go ahead and go... Uh... It's a Halloween spectacular. I'm really regretting waiting for you to be free to record this episode now. Uh, that's right. You've set me free from my thousand-year prison. <laughs> Spooky stuff. That's... I'm trying to get into the season. You guys are such a drag. We're here to talk about spooky games, yo. You go to your friendly local game store, and the only thing on the shelf is Candyland. Ah! No! We are here to talk about spooky games. We are here to talk about spoopy games as well. Matt, you're such a boomer, you didn't even know what that meant. I can't believe it. No, uh, spooky's not a thing. I refuse to engage with it. Uh, I gave up on learning internet lingo about the time that uh, I can has cheeseburger became a thing, <laughs> and I decided uh, I decided that I I'm out. That's enough internet. I don't want to learn any more your lingo. Yeah, but you basically gave up on the internet when it started. Yes, that's actually very accurate. It's amazing that I'm even on a podcast. Uh, <laughs> I was under the impression for a number of episodes that this was a local radio program. Yeah, Matt keeps trying to, to reach out to me on IRC, and I'm like, I don't, no one has that anymore. Yeah, I keep asking why we don't have more callers on this. We are going to go ahead and move on to our soapboxes. And first up, Aaron, I know you have a hot take for us. So I recently, for the first time, played a very popular, very infamous game called Sidereal Confluence. It is a game entirely about trading with other players basically you've got uh some some cards in front of you that represent machines that take some resources and turn them into other resources the problem is you don't make the resources that you need in order to run your machines so you run your machines you get your pile of resources and then the trading phase starts and this happens in real time everyone's it is literally a Kazakh marketplace, everyone shouting across the table, offering three reds for two blues, or five grays for seven yellows. Just, it's getting crazy, it's getting wild. I am something of a, a wallflower, as, as somebody with, uh, with, with some, some anxiety issues. Uh, and I think, and this is, this is a hot take, it's going to get me some, some hate mail on Twitter, uh, but I won't see it because I don't ever use Twitter. Uh, I think it's a bad game, and I think that any game that is entirely reliant on your ability to navigate social skills is a bad game design. I think most social deduction games are not good design. What? What kind of, what kind of wild hot take did you just throw out there like we weren't going to challenge it? Any game that has social deduction is not good design? Most social deduction games. Like... Like, regular werewolf is a bad game. It's an activity that's complicated. It's barely a game. Because you just have to, you have to guess and intuit. And it's all about how good you are at schmoozing the other people around the table. And that's nonsense and that's crap and get out of here. I don't want to play that. It's a bad game. <laughs> You know, you can be objectively wrong, but I do, I do understand the frustration because 
it's a lot of social deduction games, especially games that rely 100% on trading. Like if you if you're not good at sweet talking, if you're if your approach to a trade is this is what I want. Oh, you don't. You, oh, you don't want that. Um, okay. I guess I guess we'll just do what you want instead. You know, and just roll over like a limp fish. You know, if like, if I can lose a game, if I can lose a board game because I got talked down or shouted over. I think that's bad game design. <laughs> well, it's it's exploiting a skill set that is uh, not necessarily in everybody's like wheelhouse. Uh, it makes me think of one of the great, uh, one of my favorite lines from a great show, Gravity Falls, uh, when they play uh, the Dungeons and Dragons uh, parody game, Dungeons, Dungeons, and more Dungeons. And uh, Gr- Grunkle Stan says, only nerds would design a game where charisma is a superpower. <laughs> uh, it's, and it's, it's true. It's, it's sort of true. And so I think that part of our aversion to social deduction games is that they require us as nerds to do that uh, most dreaded of things, interact with humans, uh, with our voices, look upon them, look upon their ghastly visages with our, with our own eyes and have to make assessments about what they're saying. It, they are like uncomfortable and they're definitely not for everybody. Even playing like mafia and you know those uh, you know dreaded like party games, youth group games. If you were a kid who grew up in uh, church youth group culture and have to play mafia, like those could be like agonizing for the introverted people in the crowd. But social deduction games, like writ large, can't be just like you know totally written off because even like really great games that aren't social deduction games, like Dune, uh, have social aspects as you try to figure out who's bluffing and who's lying but you're probably not wrong about sidereal confluence uh this game looks insane it looks just like a like a just a barf of like crazy like cards and iconography and it looks confusing it sounds like a very unfortunate diagnosis that you would get at a doctor um (laughs) You've got a. I'm, I'm sad. I'm sad to report that you've got a sidereal confluence, and we're going to have to operate immediately. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's very much an activity, and if you it's not an activity you enjoy, then it's not going to go great, you know. And I mean, you know, I think on a small level, those games can be fun. The the trading card game Pit, where you're basically just trying to collect a full hand of the same cards, and you're like yelling at each other, "I got two to trade," you know, things like that. Like it's uh, that can be fun, but in small doses, maybe it works better for people. But you know. It's good. It's good though. Can I just really Works quickly? Good. I don't want to. I don't want to spend too much time on this game, but I'm looking at pictures of it on BGG, and I'm looking at. I haven't played the game, so Aaron, you'll have to correct me. But I'm looking at what appears to be uh, cards representing the various uh, races or uh, factions that you can play in the game. And I'm going to read some of these names to you. This sounds like. Uh, good luck. Yeah. Okay. This just every like... players every every race has a full sheet front and back player guide and included on the player guide is a phonetic pronunciation of each race's name because it's all nonsense. There were some that I looked at for 10 minutes, had the pronunciation guide, and I still was like, I don't, these letters don't, that's not a sound that I can make with my human mouth. Sure. There's some of them that you're like, okay, that's a word. Well, it's not really a word, but I can suss it out. The Kaleon Plutocracy, or right. the Federian Conclave, or the Yinji Society. And then you get into the Kitzer Kitzeril Atocracy, the Imdral Nomads, or my favorite, the Kiyijik. Kavalumian Directorate, uh, spelled K J S J A V I K A L I M M. The second M is just offensive. That does sound like a lot. It's actually really interesting, though, that you did like mention that, like that the theme almost in some ways kind of makes it that much harder to get into because that actually dovetails a little bit into your soapbox, Matt, that you're going to be coming up with. We're going to be talking about parks and how the theme feels almost tacked on because I know you guys played it digitally the other day and it really changed the experience of the game for you. Absolutely. Yeah. So not this Sunday, not this past Sunday, but the Sunday before, as if that matters in time, you could be listening to this episode in 40 years from now on the irradiated wasteland of new America. The, uh, we played, uh, one of our fellow dice pirates, Max was, uh, under the weather. So we had our Sunday night game night online on board game arena. And we played an old favorite that we all like, and that is parks. 
And here's the thing about Parks. Parks is a looker. Parks is a tactile uh, nirvana of like wonderful little things to pick up and play with. Uh, a little wooden moose and a little piece of uh, sunshine. I mean, it just, you couldn't, and a little hiker that you can happily bebop down a trail. Uh, it's a great, wonderful game to play. Max even splurged for the giant neoprene mat that just makes the whole thing more attractive and fun. Playing it uh, online, it kind of revealed that absent those wonderful textural experiences and the visuals of playing with those pieces, it's kind of just a B-flat worker placement game. It's kind of like Takato with an attitude. It just uh, it wasn't as fun. And I kind of realized that some games... Uh, some good games are made great because of, uh, good pieces. Sometimes even a bad game might be made good. And absent those, uh, visceral kind of textural experiences of playing with it, you kind of reveal that the mechanics themselves don't really hold together. What'd you think, Aaron? You were in on that game. Parks is the, the latest in a game, uh, that, that got its success from what I call the Splendor Effect. Mm -hmm. uh, because as as I've brought up multiple times on here, uh, I hate Splendor. It's a terrible game, and I never want to play it again. Objection! You are that is an objectively wrong opinion, sir. Splendor is uh, objectively a very simple and bad game. Uh, it would it would not be a game that we are still talking about right now today, if the little gems that you have to collect had just been little cardboard chits that you punched out of a board and then just kind of threw in a loose pile on the table. The fact that they were these beautifully printed, wonderfully weighted, these like heavy, thick, solid little poker chips that you can rattle around in your hand and they make such a satisfying little thunk when you drop them on the table. If the game had not come out with those, it would have come and gone and we all would have forgotten about it. But it was nice to touch, and that made you enjoy playing it. Yeah. And in parks, you have, uh, in addition to the your four main resources that you, you use throughout the game, you can also acquire wild resources. And in this game, the wild resources are represented by this absolute smorgasbord of little woodcut animals. And there's like a dozen different animals or something. So... Throughout the game, you probably could go a whole game and not grab the same wild animal over the course of the entire game. So each time you get one, it's an exciting thing because you got a moose and a bear and a fish and a bird, and you just have this little menagerie in front of you that you're using as you're going down the trail. And and as you said, I mean, the, the production of, of parks is bar none. Parks as a physical board game is a justification for why board games should exist physically and not just all be on computers. It's, it's, the artwork is beautiful. The components are a delight to behold. It's, it's got the shrink form uh, trays uh, by the company Game Trays, and they're even molded to look like bits of wood that have had bowls carved out of them to put the resources into. Physically, it is a, a wonder to behold man when you when you're just playing just the game part of it it loses 80 percent of that magic and mm. i wouldn't know if, i don't know if i call it 80 percent, but i would say maybe half maybe half of the fun is it's gone. not it, it was still a fun game i had a good time yeah it's it. it's not bad, not bad but again if it had just been little cardboard tokens that you threw in a bag mm -hmm. when you put it in the box I would have come and gone, would not have gotten the yeah. uh, sequel slash lighter version that you can get now, Trails. Like... Yeah. It wouldn't have been the phenomenon that it was. And it, uh, well, I think you made the point of what I really wanted to mention with this as being a soapbox is just the beauty of board games as a medium is that it combines gameplay with tactile physical experiences. That's what's so wonderful and beautiful about the hobby. It's a game that celebrates graphic and, and, and structural design, component design, as much as it celebrates smart rules. And uh, Parks is by no means a bad game, but married with its really exceptional sense of like who it wants to be visually and the story it wants to tell with its components, it becomes something 
really exceptional. On a board game arena, it's just a just fine worker placement game. I feel like I need to, you know, peek behind the curtain here. I have an embarrassing number of like Simon bucket of plastic board games where I mm-hmm. bought the extras to get all of the bits and pieces in custom sculpted plastic and resin rather oh, yeah. than being cardboard shit. So like, I mean, let's be honest. There's nobody out there playing the others in some of these like crazy games that Simon put out that had like limited runs, but everybody wants that like giant tentacle beast thing. Yeah. Ain't nobody out there playing Cthulhu Death May Die. They just want that giant Cthulhu thing. This is definitely a topic that I think we're going to come back to at some point. In many ways, an extension of our discussion on theme and the way that components and the theme in general just accentuate a game. Something that I wish I'd come at. I want to come back at you, Aaron, but of course, in the interest of time, we can't get too into it because we do want to talk about our games for this episode. But uh, That just sounds like you agree is what I'm hearing. You're 100% but, uh... wrong. You could not be more wrong. You're removed from this podcast. <laughs> Good day, sir. We are going to go ahead and move on to our soapboxes for this episode. That was our soapboxes. We are going to go ahead and move on to Bitter Board Gamers for this episode. Of course, the game where I read some one-star reviews from BGG, and you guys are going to go ahead and guess what game they are from. You guys ready? You guys excited? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. First review for your first game. Not really a game. A total snooze fest where the decision making is easy and the game is plagued with way, way too much randomness. You want to go somewhere? Okay, there's a 1 in 12 chance that you just die on the way. Can you influence that? Not likely. Stay away from this pile of crap. Uh, I know what this is. You know what this is? I know what this is. Cause it's a game that I love. I think I know what this is. The 1 in 12 chance that you die on the way there is the giveaway. It's, it's dead of winter. It is, in fact, it's, it's dead, dead of, of winter. winter. It's dead of winter. These, okay, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> what, they said it's a snooze fest where every decision is like, what, read that first part again where they talked about it being a snooze fest. A total snooze fest where the decision making is easy and the game is plagued with way too much randomness. That is, it is okay. Hi. Your, your own logic is flawed, sir, BGG reviewer. Because the games, the the decisions in the game cannot be easy if it is if there's an agonizing one in twelve chance of choice of death every time you move. The choices are agonizing by design. That's what makes Dead of Winter. I mean, I, sometimes the choice is logical, like I need to scavenge gasoline, so I should probably go to the gas station. But the choice of whether or not to go to the gas station is brutal because you could get killed or you could get frostbite. Uh, it is uh, that edge of your seat tension of like risk reward. It could be just as easy to not go to the gas station and ask one of your uh, table mates to go get the gasoline, but then maybe we don't get enough gasoline and maybe the colony collapses and maybe there was a traitor all along. It's it's these choices that make Dead of Winter great. I This, this game, is I, completely unrelated. I just want to say I'm really loving uh, punch drunk tired Matt Clower energy on this episode. Coming in hot. Coming in hot. No holds barred. He is, he's going to let it all out. Whew. Are you guys ready for a second game? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. First review. It's just an awful read the idiot's mind game. I mean, uh, Cards Against Humanity? Uh, not Cards Against Humanity, although that would fit. I mean, I've never, I've never played Cards Against Humanity. I have a, I just, I just am opposed to it on like, I'm just opposed to it on grounds that it looks stupid. <laughs> it just doesn't look fun. I'm a, uh, a, a, a soft Cards Against Humanity apologist. I think it does not deserve all of the hate that it gets. I'm not saying that Cards Against Humanity is a good game. Or a great game, well, we but what I am saying is like. This episode. <laughs> <laughs> but what I am saying is, if you have a group of friends and that's the only game that you ever play and you play it every single weekend, absolutely you hate it. But like, mm-hmm. if you played Scythe every weekend for three years, you'd hate Scythe too. Because... So I just want to I just want to make sure we're on record here. The man who says he despises social deduction games is defending yeah. Cards Against Humanity. In the same I wanna, episode. I just want to say this. 
I'm getting whiplash. He's, like, he's, and he's morally opposed to Splendor. He's taking a hard stand against <laughs> Splendor, and he's come to the defense of cards against the enemy. <laughs> Sir, who are you? Look, you brought me on here for my my good looks and my hot takes, and I can't give the audience my good looks. So good, lo- good looks and hot takes. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's, okay. <laughs> that, that's that's a discussion we're going to come back to because I think there's a lot to dive in there. But I am going to give you your second review. Worst game ever. Just like Battleship, but with words. Except the original Battleship is more fun. In fact, this is more like Battleship the movie. Wait, they're not talking about code names, are they? They're talking about code, code names? names. Get out of here. Get out of here. Who are these people? <laughs> Code names is beautiful, elegant, smart, fun. It's everything you want in a board game. I don't even have anything else to say about it. I also really enjoy some of the re releases they've done. Codename Pictures is, I think, actually an amazing variation on the game. I've that's never played that. I'm it's very fantastic. curious about it. Yeah, that sounds it's, awesome. It, the pictures are also, they're all kind of like abstract not not fully abstracted but they're all real weird pictures that give you a lot of flexibility to kind of do things it's pretty cool I, you know we should talk about that sometime but i think code names just as a party game is, is a great game there's a reason it's still so popular i just want to say one last thing about code names though like uh, the you know code names is cool but the real ones are out there playing decrypto that's all I yes oh my gosh that's all i want to say about that oh decrypto <laughs> We're making we're, te- we're making some real deep cuts on this. The, we're gonna be we're gonna be revisiting this, this called, episode. We're we're, re- uh, we're retitling this uh, the Bold Stances podcast. <laughs> at the last Simon Expo, at the last Simon Expo, uh, I was playing the crypto at a table with a group of people, and Eric Lang walked over as I was explaining it to everyone, and he just like whispered in my ear, and he was like, "This is the best game I've ever played," and then walked off, and I was like. I, I don't need to buy any more games. I mean, I did, yeah. but... And he's never like, washed that ear. That's true. <laughs> that's true. It's still just got, like, a little bit of Eric Lang DNA just, on Just a little bit of oh, whisper okay. just hanging around. All right, yeah, we're going to move on um, before this gets any weirder. We're going to go ahead and get into our discussion about some good, spooky Halloween games. We'll be oh, right yeah. back. Oh, yeah. Forgot what we were talking about. All righty. And welcome back to the Dice Pirates. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> okay, that was a terrible idea. Uh, welcome back to the Dice Pirates for our main topic this week. And we're talking about, as the kids say, I've been informed, spoopy games. That's right. Halloween season is upon us. And so we're going to talk about some of our favorite games for creepy times. Games to play when it's spooky or when you want to evoke the spooky season. So uh, we got a few choice picks for you for uh, Halloween parties, and uh, we're going to kick it off. Uh, you know, board gamers love themselves some Lovecraftian themes, and there's a lot of great options out there in that space, from the venerable Arkham Horror series to others. But uh, Ian's got one that I think probably hasn't got enough attention. Uh, Ian, tell us about Mountains of Madness. So Mountains of Madness is, as you speak, you know, a Lovecraftian type game it is built on that whole idea you are ascending a mountain you are trying to escape and as you do so you're getting to the top of this mountain you're taking a plane you're trying to fly away and it is a cooperative game you are working together to reach through it's reminiscent of games like elder sign where you can choose what speed you want to go you don't have to rush to the end you can stay in the easier areas but the longer you stay the harder it's going to get. It's also very similar to something like Dead of Winter, where you have to work together to provide the appropriate resources to pass each challenge. And where this game really comes into its own is that process. You have one person who acts as a leader. They're going to turn over the card. They're going to let everyone know what is needed for that round. And then you go into the communication round. So in this game, nobody's allowed to talk to each other. You're not allowed to tell people what you have in your hands until that happens, until you start until you start that process of working together and the round begins where you can communicate in this phase. And so that seems easy. It's like, okay, well, now we can talk. We can tell people what we have. But as you progress through the game, as you get relics, as you get new cards, things are going to help you, you also get madness cards. Madness cards are going to give you, they're essentially going to give you a handicap that you have to work with 
over the course of the game. Like for instance, when you're communicating, you may have to face away from the table and you can't talk to anybody specifically, or you might have to high five everyone at the table before you say anything at all. Random things like that, but you also can't tell people what your madness is. You're not allowed to say what it is. And then after the communication phase is gone, you just pretend like it didn't happen. Nobody's allowed to say what it was. You can't talk about, you know, oh, okay, no, so I need to do this. I need to shake your hand before I give you a card. You can't say anything like that. So everyone has to figure it out. And so you're, you're trying to get through this process. You're trying to work together. But as you go throughout the game, it just gets wackier and wackier and wackier. You got people standing up and doing jumping jacks in the middle of the phase. You got one person covering their eye and using a pinky to pick their cards up. And you're like, what is happening right now? Do we, do we have enough? Do we have enough gems? Do we have enough pickaxes? What's going on? Can we talk? Please, guys, I don't know if we got this right. We're about to lose. We're about to stay on this mountain for the rest of our lives. We're about to die. It gets crazy, but in a really fun way that I think makes it a great Halloween game for that reason is that the process of playing, just the, the zanier it gets and this mounting like madness that you have to deal with, I think makes it a super fun choice for, for that style of game. I love the sound of this game because it does something that every single Lovecraftian game is trying to do, but I feel like this game approaches it in a more unique and interesting way, and that is every every Lovecraftian game is about gradually losing your, your mind and going insane. That's kind of uh, the, the baseline uh, level of every uh, H.P. Lovecraft story, is somebody is exposed to some horrible truth about the universe that pushes them past the boundaries of sanity. And if you've read the Mountains of Madness short story or, no, or novella that this game is loosely adapted from, which you should, because it's great, uh, that's kind of the premise, is some explorers head into the Arctic and discover something so shocking about humanity that it drives them insane. But every game, ha every Lovecraftian game from like Arkham Horror to Eldritch Horror to other horrors all have this mechanic of slowly losing your sanity. And it's usually rendered as like getting a pile of like tokens that indicate you're going crazy. And then you get too many and it's like, you're insane. But this game is forcing you to act and react to the world in nonsensical ways. And it's trying to simulate insanity in a way that hinders the game. I think that's smart. I can also see why a lot of people bumped off of this. This game has a really like, divisive uh presence on uh, board game geek it's got like a 6.6 .6 rating which is basically the board game equivalent of love it or hate it and i can see some people really not liking uh doing all of these weird stunts and and things that uh feel a little silly and uncomfortable but i think it's smart i think it's a great way to render the idea that like you're going crazy yeah and i think that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about a lot of these halloween games like what makes a spooky game there are plenty of games out there that are super tightly designed, that are well made, that you can have a like well-rounded experience with, but you're looking for an adventure with these games. You're looking for something fun, something that gives you an experience like a, a group moment. And I think that, you know, like you said, you know, it, people may bounce off of it because of the weirdness of it, but I think if you're looking for kind of a, a group storytelling moment if you're looking to enjoy the process of, of the game and not worrying about where you end up i think a lot of these games are great so that's why i i personally really enjoy mountains of madness i'm looking forward to playing it again when i get a group it combines a lot of like the best parts of you know dead of winter elder sign uh things like that i i like that a lot so i'm looking forward to trying that with you guys sometime I also like that it's a little bit silly, which is an underrated part of the halloween and like horror experience is the winking kind of like uh, that it should be a little bit funny. May I mean, not always. I mean, I know some people genuinely like like horror movies that are just like relentlessly scary. But when you're trying to have like a Halloween party and you're trying to have people over and you want to you want an experience that's like spooky themed, but probably more laughs. Like this is a good choice because some of the stunts and things that you have to do are a little bit silly, and everyone having to to do it around the table is uh, gonna be by its nature like a little bit awkward. And so this is a good, like, somewhere between a board game and a party game. It also reminds me of so much of a completely underrated party game called Tada that Simon published back in 2016. And uh, is also love it or hate it because it has that same mechanic of your opponents can, like, curse you with various afflictions that uh, 
force you to like maybe only pick up the dice with two fingers or have to hold a finger mustache up to your face while you play the game. It's just, it's really silly and it's, uh, it's actually, it's just a lot of fun. Tada! So good. That was always I loved running demos of Tada because it did not matter what convention we were at. If we had that on the table, everyone was coming over to see the game. Where like one person had the side of their head to the table, the other person had to like stand up and sit down and stand up and sit down. Everyone was doing T Rex arms. So I. You know, to, to your point of uh, silliness is, is a good thing. Uh, you know, it's it's not something that you see in a lot of board games of just like get wacky and embrace that wackiness. Uh, and I think that mechanically that's a really that's a really interesting way to represent that idea of like the madness and the going insane is by having these weird physical quirks that you have to actually you know, constrain yourself to as a manifestation of the fact that you're all slowly losing your minds. I think that's a that's a really interesting design mechanism. Ian, what do you think about the look and the components of this one? It's uh, it's probably more simple. It's table presence. As I'm looking at pictures of it, I haven't played it, but it looks a little, it has good art, but it's it's more simplified than. A lot of these horror themed Lovecraftian adventures where there's like lots of minis and things. Do you feel like it, it still works and it feels evocative? I think it does feel evocative. I think it's important actually to have a simpler look to the game because a lot of it is going to be based around, okay, well, we need to make sure we have this many cards with this symbol on it and this many, this many symbols. And so you got to make sure that's easily determinable and especially when you're doing all these crazy things at the table you don't want to have a million things that you can knock over you want to keep things fairly simple and it helps keep cost down as well for a game that's going to be a little bit more interesting a little bit maybe not some people aren't as willing to pick it up because of how strange it might be i think it's worth it to make sure that the price point is a little bit more you know a little bit more comfortable for some people because i think that's going to bring a lot of people in and i mean there's still some like it's not because it, it it may look simpler, but the components are still well designed. Like it's still a really nice looking game. It still feels good to play around with. So even though it might not be the most beautiful looking game ever, it may not be you know quite as it may not be quite as literal as something like Betrayal or maybe Dead at Winter. I still think there's a lot to you can still get a lot out of this game, especially because it's almost more about the interactions you have with other people than you have with the board itself. Sure. Cool. Sounds like a fun one. The next game we're talking about has a great tagline on BGG. It's another one that is a little bit split. People do rate it 6.3, but I'm excited to hear more about it. The tagline says, use transparent cards to tell tragic tales of misery and misfortune. It's Gloom, an older one from 2005. Aaron, you brought this one to us. Tell us about Gloom. Gloom is a fantastic little card game. It's it's great. Uh, it's a it's a it's a great game for when you've got you know two or three or four people and you're waiting on the last person to show up. It's a fantastic little time killer. Basically, in Gloom, you have your family in front of you. I know that there are expansions that add like there's you could have a house and pets, but this is all just based on my most recent play of the the base game. You have four family members, roughly mom, dad, brother, sister. And the goal of the game is to make your family as miserable as possible and then kill them while they're very sad. And the more sad they are, the more points you get, and that's how you win the game. Um, so as you were saying, in the, the cards in this game are all this uh, transparent plastic. So you've got the portrait in the middle... And then the rest of the card is, is see-through. And you play cards on top of your family members as well as your opponent's family members. And those cards will have modifiers around the portrait that start to stack up on top of each other. And so the game becomes trying to figure out the best way to... Because it's each card is going to have multiple modifiers in the circle around it. 
and wherever there's a modifier or even just a blank, it's going to cover up that same spot on everything below it. So you have to, to puzzle out how to get this minus 15 and this minus 20 on your family member in the right order so that you're not accidentally covering up one of those negatives because the person at the end of the game with the lowest, most negative score is the winner. You can also play cards on your opponent's family members that make them happier. Part of the, the, the real fun of the game to me is that all of these cards that you're playing on the other family members have a little, you know, five or six word, just a little brief story underneath the, the, the title of the card or the banner of the card that just kind of says like, hey, how's your day going? You know, I might play a card on, on your dad, Matt, that says, uh, won a pie eating contest. And then he gets a plus 15 to his happiness, and you don't like that. So then you might play a card on top of that that says, uh, got pushed into traffic, and now it's a minus 20. So it's just about telling a story. It, it really gets a lot of fun if everyone gets into it, and you try and figure out the, the narrative thread that you're weaving for all of your family members, and just how wild and wacky of a day they're having that they won a pie eating contest, got pushed into traffic, uh, got saved by an old woman, and then later had to bury the old woman because that was their mom. <laughs> and it's just about timing, making sure you can you can kill your family member at just the right moment and make sure they have the worst, most untimely death of all. Uh, mechanically, it's a very simple game, so I kind of understand why it has the ratings that it has but it's it's a real hoot and a half like i said it's it's a great game to play because the cards are all plastic it's a great game to play if you're sitting having a couple around the table yeah if somebody knocks thing something over you don't have to worry about anything getting ruined just rinse them off uh, but yeah no it's it's a it is an excellent excellent little game like you know if we're if the, the context for this episode is that you're having a Halloween party, this is a fantastic addition to that. And you can get the base game for like, I don't know, 10, 15 bucks on Amazon. It's real small. It'll fit in your backpack. This looks great. I'm so into this. I've heard, I've, I've heard of Gloom. It's kind of like, it is interesting because it's at the very kind of bleeding edge of like the uh, board game renaissance in some ways, like 2005 kind of like shortly after the big uh, uh, Catan boom and the interest in the board game is starting to really ramp up. And so this is sort of an early game and people aren't talking about it anymore these days, but I'm, I'm familiar with it. But I've never seen a copy in the wild. I would love to play it. I could see why this game has a relatively low ranking on BGG because the BGG community tends to really reward crunchy, thinky games that more traditionally meet that definition of like a game a game for gamers and this is much more of a storytelling experience than a game it has rules it has an objective but it's much more like you said about the story you're weaving about the day it's closer to kind of a loosely structured role-playing game than anything from the look of it uh and so i can see why if you're sitting down to the table wanting a crunchy strategic experience this isn't that but if you want to weave a gloomy story about some dark uh dark sad family which is great for Halloween or spooky season. This is awesome. It also, I think it's worth talking for a minute about how great the pen and ink art is on these cards. Oh, it's yes. this black and white style that is somewhere between Edward Gorey or like the old school Adams Family cartoons by cartoonist Charles Adams. They are awesome. These cards look great. They're a little weird because they're like pictures printed on translucent plastic, so they're like a little odd, but I can imagine in my mind how when you're laying them down and they're starting to like build up and like they probably look great all out on the table i mean i'm just going to come out and say it uh gloom walked so that mystic veil could run it it invented the yeah the transparent cards on top of other cards and you can see through the whole stack 
You're right. I mean, other games have taken what this did and uh, have done it, uh, you know, in a different way and, and really built upon it. So you're absolutely right about that. I wonder if this is ever going to, has this been reprinted? Is this still like relatively available? Yeah. I mean, it's still, I think they had a Kickstarter like a couple years ago where they were, it was like reprinting all of the old stuff plus a bunch of new stuff in one box to fit it all in. If there's one complaint I have about the game, and it's such a minor, barely a complaint. Each expansion that you get and the base game will only ever fit in the box it came in. So if mm. you buy one or two of the expansions, of which there are a whole bunch, you either have to separate them out afterwards or just be okay with the fact that the game is spread out across three different boxes and you have to grab all three of them every time you want to play. Which is not the worst thing, because again, they're little tiny... I mean, honestly, worst case scenario, you could just buy like a one of those really big Magic the Gathering deck boxes and shove it all in there, and then it's just ready to go wherever you are. That's a game that actually looks super... I think I'm going to be looking out for that one, because I like the idea of a nice, short, fun little game. Especially, I mean, you know, the, the plastic cards, I think that's... I think that's a real cool. I think that's really neat to have. Definitely nice to not have to worry about the state of your games when you bring them out as well. The next game we're going to talk about is one of the facade games that they have put out, Salem 1692. A lot of the games they put out actually would fit in here, but we're going to focus on Salem. It is in many ways, you know, it's it's very similar to Mafia, one of those social deduction games. I'm sorry, Aaron. I know I know you're going to have a bad time. Um, but we're going to but it's essentially, you know, figuring out who the witches are and everyone has a different role. You may be the mayor, you may be the butcher in town. Everyone has a little bit of a different power that they have. And it plays in many of the same ways that a mafia game does during the nighttime. Everyone's going to go ahead and close their eyes. The witches choose somebody to eliminate. But there's enough to spice it up that I actually quite like this in preference to a lot of these other social social deduction games. I think it has a lot going for it. Aaron, you've played this a bit as well. How do you feel about this one? Uh, this is hands down, without a doubt, uh, absolutely, this is my wife's favorite game ever of all time. Uh, anytime we go on vacation or we're headed to any sort of a game day, the only thing she will tell me as we're walking out the door is like, you grab Salem, right? Like you have that. <laughs> um, and this is, this is going to come as, as a, a shock to, uh, you know, I, with, with my earlier deriding of social deduction games, I really like Salem and I think it's a really good game to your point, Ian, it really does a lot to mix up, social deduction games you're not having to rely on your ability to tease out and intuit little pieces of information mm -hmm. based on hunches from people uh core mechanics of the game you have a, a deck of cards that everyone's drawing from and some of them are accusations that you put in front of a player because you think that they're a witch and if they get enough of them then they have to uh, you know be, be forced into a situation where they may have to confess you will also have cards that can there's there's a there's two cards that make two players be soulmates for the rest of the game where if one of them dies the other one of them dies sorry about you uh there are cards that are beneficial that say uh whoever has this card in front of them can't can't you can't play accusations on them or you can't play other negative cards on them and the beauty of the game is you can't ever play a card on yourself you have mm -hmm. to put it in front of another player so just that really allows you to you're not having to pay close attention to who's side eyeing who around the table because Matt just played the card on Ian that gets rid of all of his accusations. So 
that's something that we are all aware just happened and we all need to be paying attention to because one of them knows something about the other. And it could be that they both somehow know that they're not witches and they're just trying to keep themselves alive to to get to the end of the game to defeat the witches. Yeah, that's one of the things I like a lot about the game is that instead of just having a very binary, like you are the mafia or you're not the mafia, you have a collection of cards in your hand that will say you're not a witch or you are a witch. And uh, you can like reveal the ones that say you're not a witch as you move, as you get accused. And so naturally people are going to start losing cards around the table and the card, the witch cards can actually pass around. You may be in situations where you give somebody else a witch card and they also become a witch. So it's not about, it's not about taking, it's not about finding and exposing all of the witches. It's only about finding and exposing those cards. So you may be doing a great job, but if you have to pass your witch card to somebody on the right and they only have one card left, they could get, found out somebody could accuse them and that card may come out. And so it, while it does, you know, enable you to, you know, play a good social game while you can hide things, sometimes it does allow people to have like a come from behind moment and just spices just enough variation into it. So it's not just your bog standard like, oh, well, I guess they I guess they just played the game well and then, you know, took everybody out during the night when nobody could stop them. So I, I think it balances that enough that it's worth trying out. And the the box it comes in is so cool. The facade yes. games all have the it's a magnetic case that opens up. It's a hollowed out book. It's it's so nice. Yeah, uh, this is probably my favorite variation on the werewolf mafia theme. Uh, having not played Blood on the Clock Tower, which kind of looms out there as like a game a lot of people love. It kind of takes this whole experience to the next level. Uh, but having not played Blood on the Clock Tower, which I'd love to, this is, I think, the best variation on that idea it has the most tense like nighttime phase where everyone closes their eyes and the witches might kill somebody uh, or maybe they won't and uh there's just all so and all the different roles and powers and card play and you're right the whole thing comes packaged in this beautiful box that feels uh like a great experience when you open it up and spread all the cards out this was a, just to me just a pitch perfect game for a halloween party for a spooky season gathering it's got everything you need tension which is it's genuinely scary in its own kind of way right because i mean the real sort of fear of like what's going on when the everyone's eyes are closed is actually kind of palatable and that's something you don't always get in uh spooky board games is actual quasi like fear is that this is actually like as close as i think as you get of the games we're going to talk about tonight to something that's genuinely spooky so this one is pretty good pretty darn good facade is just awesome they were actually, you could probably made the argument to pick maybe even like Bristol as a tense, quasi spooky game about a dark theme. But this is the only one of theirs that really approaches like supernatural and Halloweeniness. Halloweeniness? Yeah, that's a word. Let's go with that. The last game we are going to talk about is, in many ways, I, I think one of the quintessential Halloween board games. Matt, you're going to talk to us about Betrayal at House on the Hill. What's up with this game? Of course I'm going to talk to you about this. We can't have a spooky theme episode and not talk about the, the granddaddy of them all of spooky games, Betrayal at House on the Hill. Uh, the best worst game. The be it, Yes, exactly right. It is truly the best worst game. And so we'll, let's get into it right at the beginning. Well, I mean, if you don't know what Betrayal is, and of course you do, because if you're listening to this podcast, you probably played it and maybe and you probably have strong feelings about it. But Betrayal of House on the Hill is a game of exploring a haunted house. You uh, play uh, in the opening act of the game, you play a group of survivors and a, uh, a group of explorers in a loosely cooperative uh, fashion, uh, moving through rooms in a house that is kind of being procedurally generated by drawing a new room from a deck as you move through. And as you do, you're going to have all sorts of weird encounters. You might... Uh, run into uh, an event that you have to use RPG-like dice rolling to try to survive uh, a boulder swinging towards you or a trapdoor opening or something like that. Uh, you might have, uh, you might find an awesome item that can help you uh, survive the horrors of the house, or you might run into an omen, which leads to the game's uh, kind of core mechanic of love it or hate itness. Uh, when you find an omen, which is usually just a, a beneficial item of some kind, you make a roll, 
And then as the almonds stack up, you'll eventually fail this omen uh, roll, and it will cause the haunt to happen. And this is where the game really be goes either off the rails or becomes something really special. Uh, when the haunt happens, depending on the room you're in and the, and the omen that triggered it, uh, one of 50 different uh, possible scenarios will transpire that you uh, read out of uh, two uh, narrative books that come in the game. And uh, one player will become the traitor, and the rest of the players will band together and form a team of survivors, and then it is a race to see which side can complete their uh, individual objective. And there's a wide range of possible scenarios in this, from traditional horror stuff like vampires and demons and uh, zombies to really off-the-wall scenarios like a mad scientist has shrunk you down to the size of mice or you've been warped into a strange dimension where your skin is melting. Uh, it gets crazy out there. Each scenario has unique rules that are sometimes not really well thought out and possibly broken. And this is really where the game becomes a, a true case of love it or hate it, right? The end game scenario in any given scenario in any given session of Betrayal at House on the Hill can be almost entirely broken. Uh, it may be that the person playing uh, the antagonist is hugely overpowered because they found the blood dagger and a suit of armor in the first game and they quickly, in the first half of the game, and they quickly mow through the survivors. Uh, it may be that the uh, survivors win because they all happened by the procedurally generated nature of the house to be standing next to the rooms where the items they needed, the MacGuffins were, and they assemble the thing and end the evil within like two or three turns. You really just don't know if the game is actually going to click and become playable and fun. Uh, because of that, it is polarizing. But I love this game. It's so weird and random and some of the best things that's happened playing in board games to me have happened in this game and some of the most frustrating. It's just like that. What do you guys, how do you guys feel about Betrayal at House on the Hill? I have had absolutely some of the most fun I have ever had playing board games, playing Betrayal on the House of the Hill. And I have also had absolutely terrible, I never want to play this game again and it sucks and I hate it playing betrayal on the house of the hill it's just that kind of a game it's the sort of game where you have to know when you sit down when you're going into it that like you all have to be along for the ride and it's gonna end well or it's just gonna suck but the journey it's about the journey and not the destination it's about the the story that unfolds as you're playing not really about the win loss at the end in some ways this this is in some ways this game is a lot like playing D D, where you have to embrace the shared storytelling of the game because yes you may ha like you have to approach it as if you're watching a b halloween movie you know just yes somebody walks in and a headless man on fire runs behind them as they open a closet and it's like oh no do they do they lose insanity or are they are they strong enough mentally to recover from this and, and in some ways actually become you know more sto more stoic and and less will and less likely to to fall apart when they see something crazy so you have lots of small moments like that and you know if you approach it as a game that can be beaten as something that can be won in a convincing fashion then it's it's not going to be super fun i think because there is too much that can go wrong it is all about dice it's all about random moments it's all about the huge swings back and forth and the, the craziness that can happen in those so you gotta just think of it as a, a b movie that you're creating which I, I think is a fascinating approach to a game it uh it requires i think setting it up that way i think we've had more fun with it i've had more fun with it playing with people when in the in the teach i just basically say this isn't really a game this is a B-horror movie that we're all <laughs> about to play together, that we're all about to experience together. And I think if you set it up like that, people actually relax a little bit because it's like, yeah, we're going to have a, a sense of competition in the end game, but it's more about what type of crazy things are going to happen and how wild is it going to be. Uh, I want to uh, quickly uh, read something to you guys. This is... Uh, if you have been following the Dice Pirates for a while on uh, our Instagram page, you know that we actually post about this, have posted about this game a good bit over the years. We've played it a lot. And this is a post from way back in 2017 about uh, Betrayal of House on the Hill. Uh, the caption is, let's recap how this game ended. 
a child with nerves of steel who earlier found a burning corpse in a closet and somehow gained sanity from the encounter, descends into the creepy basement, jabs an adrenaline shot into his heart, uses a magic feather, plays a tune on the organ, and warps the house back home from an alien dimension where our skin was being slowly dissolved by the atmosphere. Uh, say what you will about Betrayal at House on the Hill, but there's not really nothing else in board gaming that can provide such crazy, unforgettable moments. And to me, that's the that's the essence of Betrayal. It is, for all its flaws, it gives you some like wild things that just shouldn't, it couldn't happen in anything else. I also think it's the best Halloween game. Obviously, it's a haunted house. It nails the atmosphere purpose perfectly. Uh, it doesn't have, by modern board gaming standards, like amazing and beautiful components, but it's it does the good. It does the job. Your the house is slowly unfolding around you. Uh, you're exploring strange places. You know, uh, a, a, a room full of weird statuary or a bloody, you know, basement room or something creepy. You uh, you do have little uh, pre-painted miniatures that are comically bad in their pre-paintedness, but there's something sort of charming about them. It really is, to me, is the best Halloween game. And uh, I do have one hack that I would recommend if you don't do it that will make the game better for you. If you're playing this game and you draw an event card, make it a house rule that when an event card is encountered, the person to the active player's left draws the event card and reads it to them. It doesn't uh, read uh, the outcome of what happens with each dice roll. That little change makes the game so much more fun and intense. Because instead of you picking up a card and immediately seeing that, like, oh, no, I'm stuck in some spider webs, and I have four different possible outcomes depending on what I roll, and there's no tension, somebody else draws the card and tells you, Aaron, you're stuck inside some giant spider webs. Okay. Make, a, make a dexterity roll. And you don't even know like what's about to happen to you, and then you roll, and then they tell you what happened to you. That's immediately better. That's a house roll that should have been in the game. Player to the active player's left reads the event cards to you and tells you what you ran into. And it also, I further recommend that you must read it in a creepy voice. You got to get into the game. I mean, reading it like that is one of the reasons why Ryan Lockett games are so good, because it brings people in. It makes it a table event instead of something that one person is doing. Because you do, like you said, you have to approach this game as a group. It's got to be fun for everybody. I do think that this game just does so much stuff really well. I, I mean, it can be an issue when one person has to become the traitor and maybe they don't understand the rules. So, I mean, like there are balance issues there, but... In general, just if you want something that's that's fun to pick up and if you're willing to, to get into the experience, I, I don't think there's a better game than this for that. I've also played the game. I want to give you another final thought as we sort of sum up this episode and this game. Uh, I've also played this game as a quasi-like dungeon master, as a DM. Uh, I played this with a group of total non-gamers uh, at an event. I was, you know, as happens when people know you're in the board game hobby, they said, bring... Uh, we're having a party. Bring some games over. And so I brought this game along with a few choices. And to my surprise, they picked this one. And I knew nobody was really going to get the light role-playing mechanics of the dice or like the traitor in-game mechanic was going to be kind of broken. So I just ran the game. And I read all the encounter cards in that manner that I just kind of described. And then walked everybody through the in-game and rolled for all the monsters instead of the players having to do monster rolls. And that worked really well. So that's another way to play it and make it a little more fun is one player can kind of serve as like the 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 storyteller moderator of sorts. And it helped too because that way nobody had to like really do learn the game. I basically just set it up and said, all right, move forward into the house based on your speed. And I didn't even explain the rules at all. I just walked them through. When something happened, I told them what's happening, what your options are. So that's another way to kind of make it work. It is kind of a big game for new gamers to learn, but... Uh, I don't know. I love it. It's a good, it's a spooky one. Uh, it's also worth noting, if you do like it, uh, There's a, there are some extra content out there for you. There was an expansion released a few years ago uh, and a legacy version of the game, which uh, I uh, hear good things about. So There's also a uh, D&D flavored version, uh, Betrayal at Baldur's Gate. If, if, that, if that appeals more to your particular tastes yes. and that one is also a little bit more balanced it prevents some of the super early events that really break 
Betrayal of House on the Hill. It, it really refines the rules a lot. In some ways, I think you should take some of those and, and use them in Betrayal of the House on the Hill. But still, I mean, I think we have a good list of games here for, you know, while they may not be the best, you know, air quotes games, they may not be the crunchiest and most refined games. I think if you're looking for a fun, nice, spooky evening, something that you can do with family, that you can do with friends, that you can all just have a good time and enjoy yourself, I don't think you can go wrong with one of these games. I want to ask you guys before we go, do you have a Halloween movie that you guys love to rewatch around this time? I know I really like rewatching Nightmare Before Christmas. Really a classic for me. Ooh, that's a good question. I don't have a I, I don't have a beloved uh spooky movie, but I did just read uh for the first time uh The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. Uh, because I watched uh, like a million people uh, watch the Netflix Haunting of Hill House uh, several years ago, uh, a couple of years back, and thought that was awesome and wanted to read the book. And man, that's a great piece of spooky fiction. If you want to read something spooky this season and you never read it, it's a justifiable classic. You don't need me to tell you that. You need to get a hold of, uh, pick up Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House. Uh, I mean, obviously, this, this goes without saying, shop smart, shop S smart. Army of Darkness, all day, every day. Love it. Great choices. That's our episode, everyone. Thanks, of course, as always, Aaron, for joining us. Matt, if you want to get in touch with us, where can they do so? You can find us on the gram, at Dice Pirates. Um, we are there, uh, you know, all through the week-ish, doing uh, lots of uh, little reviews of games we're playing, updates, all sorts of things. We would love to hear from you. I promise. We're actually really nice in real life. If you message us, if you comment, we will interact with you and even be friendly. Keep an eye out next week, of course. We will be doing another episode of the Captain's Log, keeping you up to date on the news, what is going on in the board game scene. Two weeks from now, another main episode. Got more exciting stuff for you, so watch out for that. But until then, thank you, as always, for listening, and we'll be right here on the Dice Pirates. Dice Pirates.